Okay, so hi everybody. Um, so it's uh, lecture 22. Oh, I'm not sure what happened to this. Uh, it's kind of weird. This is probably too thin, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so it's uh, lecture 22. And um, uh, so this is the, the last lecture on probability. And after this, we're gonna do graph theory. Uh, so, Oh yeah, and uh, for the midterms, uh, you you should get them back. They should be fully graded by tomorrow, and I'll send an email about that. Um, so, okay, so let's recall the basic concepts of probability, since we it might have been a little while. Uh, so, the basic terminology was you had a probability space. which consists of a sample space S and a probability function P on the sample space. Uh, and then we had the notion of uh, events, which are just subsets of the sample space. And then the probability of an event is the total probability of the outcomes in that event. So, so we have this picture of maybe a sample space and in here we have some event E. And we discussed various notions related to events, uh, namely conditional probability and independence, which I won't review in full detail. Uh, independence is particularly important for this lecture. So independence, so, so, so two events are independent if the probability of their intersection is the product of the probabilities of the individual events. Um, let me use a thicker marker. Um, and then we had this notion of uh, random variables. Uh, which was a function from the probability uh, from the sample space to the real numbers. And so the, the random variable is a function taking this probability space to the real numbers. And we had the concept of the expectation of a random variable which is just the average value over the sample space. And then we had a, another way of computing it, which was taking the average of the values in the range uh, weighted by the probabilities of seeing those values. And one thing that's gonna be important in this lecture is what is the relationship between events and random variables? They're, they're really, they're different types of objects. Um, but for every random variable, there are some natural events. So events from a random variable X are events such as the event that the value of X you know, is equal to some particular value 
or maybe it's you know bigger than some number. So given a random variable, you can define events by looking at its values. And on the flip side, oh, wait, I need to add some more pages. Let me do that. Um, and and the, uh, the flip side of this is you can have random variables from events. by taking the indicator random variable. So the indicator of E is a random variable, which is just equal to one if, so it's a function of the outcome, if S is in the event and zero otherwise. Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to, um, uh, yes, somebody has a question. Is that like uh, one subscript event, like a standard notation? That's a standard notation, one subscript event. Oh, thank you. This is called an indicator on a variable. Okay. So in this lecture, we're gonna talk about uh, three things, which are very useful in applications of probability and statistics, computer science, math, I mean, all fields. So the three things we're gonna talk about is one, we're gonna talk about how to do algebra with random variables. And also we're gonna extend the notion of independence to random variables. So, so far we, independence is only defined for events, but now we're gonna extend it to random variables. Secondly, I'm going to use these concepts to define a very important, uh, I guess, operation on a random variable, which is taking its variance. And then finally, I'm going to talk about how to use the concept of variance to solve basic statistical type problems. Uh, and specifically, I'm gonna talk about Chebyshev's inequality. So let's start by talking about algebra. Um, so, so let's let's recall that we've all, we've actually already done algebra with random variables. So recall that if x and y are random variables on the same probability space, then you can also define uh, their their sum which we've already done. So X plus Y, so this is the sum, X plus Y, and the way this is defined is X plus Y of S is just X of S plus Y of S. And uh, scalar multiple. Uh, so that's if C is some real number, you can define CX to be the random variable, which is just C times XS. And this is for all values in the in the uh, sample space. And you need C to be a real number for this to make sense. And these operations have some nice properties that we've been using so far. So the nice property of the sum is linearity. So expectation of X plus Y is expectation of X plus expectation of Y. We use that to calculate some interesting quantities in the last lecture. So here you have linearity. And you actually have a similar property for scalar multiple as well. You have expectation of CX is just C expectation of X. So now there's a natural thing to do. In algebra, we have, we have addition, but we also have multiplication. So you can also define a product of two random variables. So given these two X and Y, the product is gonna be the random variable X, Y, just defined by multiplying X of S and Y of S. 
And so now um, you can ask the question, do you expect something nice to happen here? Do you expect the expectation of X, Y to be nicely computable in terms of the expectation of X and the expectation of Y? So, um, so let's pause to think about that for a moment. So everybody think in your minds whether you think that's true. Um, Okay, so how many people think this is think this is true? Uh, as you can say in the chat, you think this is true or false? False, false, okay. Uh, okay, I'm mostly getting falses. So the two people who said false, why do you think it's false? I don't need a proof, I just want your intuition. Because we're talking about linearity and linearity doesn't include products. Like That's true. Yeah. Just looking at the word things. linearity. So yeah, I'm not actually, yeah. Okay. I'm not actually asking for linearity down here. I'm just asking if the expectation of the product is a product of the expectations, but yeah, that's a good guess. I would have put it, I would have probably said it if it did satisfy any, anybody can, can anybody think of an example why this is false? I think I'll give you a hint. I told you a moment ago how to create a random variable from any event, right? Now, what would happen if this property, let's give it a name, star, held for all random variables, including indicator random variables of events. And every two events would be independent. Yeah. So, 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 so importantly, so um, star is false in general. One way to see that is given any two events, um, can, you can consider the random variables X given by the indicator of E, Y given by the indicator of F. And then what is X, Y? So X is one if S is in, if the event E holds. Y is one if the event F holds. So X, Y is one only if both of those are one, right? So X, Y is gonna be the indicator of the intersection. This is the key property. If you multiply two indicator events of uh, indicator random variables of events, you get the indicator of the intersection. So then expectation of X, Y is the expectation of this indicator. And the expectation of an indicator is just the probability of the event. On the other hand, the expectation of X, expectation of Y is expectation of the indicator of the first event, expectation of the indicator of the second event, which is the probability of the first event times the probability of the second event. But these aren't equal in general, right? So this, this uh, the product behaves quite differently from, from linear combinations in this regard. So any questions about this little example? When you wrote um, E uh, expectation X, Y, like on the third line on this page, yeah. what does that mean? Well, so, so, so I've defined X, Y here, right? So, so for example, if X is equal to the indicator of E, Y is equal to the indicator of F, then X, Y applied to S is the indicator of E applied to S times the indicator of F applied to S. So in particular, that means it's one if both of those things are one. So it's one if S is in 
both E and F, and otherwise at zero. Does that example help? Yeah, thank you. Any other question? Okay, so these are not equal in general, but there are actually many situations where they are, and those situations are very important. And so we give this a name. Here's a definition. Uh, so uh, two random variables. X and Y, they have to be defined on the same sample space. This doesn't make sense if they're not defined on the same sample space. Are independent if uh, for every R1, R2 in the real numbers, um, the probability that X equals R1 and y equals r2 is equal to the product of the probabilities. Okay. So what this is saying is that all the events you can define by considering the value of x and the value of y, all those events are independent, right? So, so this is an event. This is also an event. This is the intersection of two events, right? And so what this is saying is that these events are independent. That's the definition of two independent random variables. Any questions about this definition? I mean, here, let me just draw a cartoon to indicate which events are being considered. So there's a sample space. And now there are two random variables on this, x and y. Now, each of these random variables defines a bunch of events, so x splits the space into a bunch of events, which are like, you know, x equals one, x equals two, x equals three, whatever the values are, x equals r in general. Similarly, the, um, the random variable y splits the sample space into events, which may have nothing to do with the x events. So maybe I should, I don't know what, marker I should use. Maybe I'll just use, uh, well, let me just make a new one. Uh, yeah, let's use a new color, I guess. So, so Y here is gonna split the sample space into its own events, right? In some other way. And so you, you get two collections of events. And what this is saying is that any event involving X and any event, event involving Y, those, those, those are independent. So this might seem like a bit of a mouthful. So let's pause to think about it. Any any, any thoughts? Could we maybe do like a concrete example? Where it works yeah, or yeah, yeah. Let's do an example. So an example is the experiment is roll two dice. Uh, roll two independent dice. So, so that's part of the modeling assumption. So now let X be the number on the first die. And Y is the number on the second. So now the, the what is true is that if you pick any outcome for the first row, one through six, and you pick any outcome for the second row, one through six, 
then the probability that the first die is that number and the second die is some other number, these events are independent, right? This is just a product of the probabilities. Going back to our very first lectures on probability. This is just a rephrasal of that in the same language. So these random variables are independent. Does that help? Yeah, could we also see an example where they are? Uh, yeah, so I kind of gave one right here, right? In the top of this page, I said, if you have any two events that are, uh, so yeah, okay. So, so a non-example would be to take the indicators of any two events that are not independent. So, so okay, so, for, uh, so, so these are independent. So however, um, I don't know. Uh, let's say x and some other random variable z, let's define z to be the indicator of um, uh, the first die is one. These are not independent. And that's because, for example, uh, to be independent for every value, for every pair of values in the ranges of these random variables, the events need to be independent. And that's not true because the probability that X equals one and Z equals one, uh, well, this is just, um, so, so X equals one is the first die is one, right? Z equals one is also the first die is one. So this is just the probability that X equals one which is one six, but then the product of the probabilities this is one over six times one over six equals one over 36. So these are not equal. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a non-example. This is a non-example. Let me just write non-example here. Okay, so the main consequence of independence that we're gonna be concerned about in this lecture is the following simple theorem. This is uh, theorem five in the book. And it says, uh, if X and Y defined on a sample space are independent random variables, then the expectation of the product is the product of the expectations. So you can get this nice property that doesn't hold in general. Now, the proof of this is just algebra and I, I, I will, I'm gonna skip the proof because it's not that interesting. And instead, let me show you an example. Let me just do the dice example again. So in example one, let's call this example one. So, so in particular, in example one, X and Y are independent random variables, right? So according to this theorem, so in example one, uh, you can define a random variable X, Y to be the product of the numbers on the two dice. So let this be a random variable, right? Then since X and Y are independent, the X average of the product is the product of the averages. And okay, in a previous lecture, we calculated these averages. I believe the averages were just uh, seven over two. 
And so the answer you get is 49 over four. That's the average product of the numbers on two dice rolls. Now, what's the, you know, what's the beauty of this? Well, the beauty is that this, this is kind of hard to control, hard to compute, right? Because the number of possible outcomes here is 36, right? I mean, it's not that hard, but it's hard to compute because uh, the, the total number of products, the total number of uh, elements in the range is 36, right? And so the whole point of independence was that using independence, you could decompose this hard or problem into easier problems. Because each of these looks only at one dice, right? Where so, did so, seven over two came from? Yeah, so somewhere I need to do this calculation here, right? That the expectation of X is one plus two plus all the way up to six divided by six. And that's seven over two. Got it. Yep. So, so the whole point of independence is it allows you to decompose a complicated random variable into simpler ones. Right, so, so, uh, so, so the left-hand side, this involves both dice. but the right-hand side is a product of things that only involve one die. Okay, so, so, so the whole point is um, uh, independence uh, allows us to decompose a complicated random variable into simpler ones. Uh, so, so, by, so, so, specifically in the in the sense of products, we already knew how to do this for sums, right? We already had linearity of expectations, linearity of expectation. But now, if we have independence, we can also do it for products. So, okay. So, so, any questions about this? How common is it that, like? two variables are gonna end up being independent. I'm, I'm thinking specifically like when we were talking with uh, events, sometimes our intuition would sort of tell us these two things are gonna be um, dependent and then they would turn out to be. Um, is that still relatively common or does it become uh, a lot less common? So let me put it this way. It's, it's a very special thing but it happens often enough that it's important. Cool. Thank you. And, and when it happens, it really makes your life much simpler. Like, so that's why it's an important concept. Okay, so, so I wanna make one more remark. So let's think about this. For, for linearity of expectation here, the first property, do you need X and Y to be independent? No. No. Yeah. We, we, we showed it's true without any assumption. So this is a, a shockingly powerful fact that's used, I mean, a lot. I use it a lot in my research. This does not require any assumption on independence. So linearity of expectation is much more widely applicable than using independence to decompose a product. Okay, so that's what I wanna say about algebra and independence. Uh, actually, no, I wanna say one more, one more thing now. So, 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 so now that we've talked about uh, sums, products, and scalar multiples, we can combine all of those things, right? So the second remark is, we can uh, combine uh, sums, products, scalar multiples, 
and and also constant random variables. So okay, so so let me add another remark. Uh, a random variable x going from s to r uh, can it's perfectly valid for it to just be constant. It's just allowed to always spit out the same number, like one or something, right? So you can so you can combine some part scalar multiples and constant random variables uh, to define uh, polynomials in random variables. So for example, uh, you, you can define x plus y squared for two random variables. So that's x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. That's a legitimate random variable. Or I can look at the random variable x plus 1 squared. Now, one here refers to a random variable, the random variable that's always one. This is a constant random variable. And the algebra works the same way. You know, these are ultimately just real numbers. I mean, they're functions, but sorry, but they're functions. But really what we're doing is we're just doing arithmetic on the uh, outcomes, or the outputs of these random variables. So the same rules of algebra apply. So this is just x squared plus 2x plus 1. So this is different from the algebra you've done before because these are functions. OK, this is a little bit of a sort of, it might hurt your brain the first if it's the first time you've seen it. But just like you can do algebra with numbers, you can do algebra with functions. So any thoughts on this? Somebody's asking, what about division? Great question. Uh, yeah, so, so you can define x over y of s to be x of s over y of s uh, when, the, so the tricky thing is when y of s is not equal to zero. This is why I didn't do it. So, so you can define a ratio of two random variables when this is true. And that's why I didn't want to do it because you then you have to keep track of that condition. But it comes up a lot. It won't come up in this course, but it's a perfectly valid thing, ratio of random variables. It's generally much more difficult to understand because of this non-zeroness condition. But that's a great question. Okay, so now that we've talked about algebra, I'm now going to introduce the concept of variance, which uses some of these notions of algebra. So, so what's the motivation? Okay, so, so, so far, We've, we've only done one thing with random variables, which is look at the expectations. However, this doesn't, this is not the whole story. Okay, random variables, the behavior of random variables, there's much more to it than just what is the expectation. So for example, let's look at two examples. Example two, Let's look at a random variable x, uh, which is, so, so let's look at a probability space s, which is heads or tails. And let's say the probability of heads is a half. Then um, let's define two random variables. x is just gonna be the random variable zero. 
constant random variable. And now y is going to be something more interesting. It's going to be plus one if, so y of s, these are functions of s, right? Is one if s is heads and minus one if s is tails. Now what, so, so now what do the distributions of these random variables look like? Well, the first one, it just puts all of its map it has probability one of being zero, that's it. So I'm just drawing cartoons of the distribution. And the second one is different, right? It has half probability of being minus one or one. So the, the, the graphs of the distributions of these random variables look very different, but what are the expectations? Well, the expectation of X is obviously just zero because it's always zero. But what's the expectation of Y? Well, it's a half times minus one plus a half times one, which is also zero. So they have the same expectation, but they're really very different, right? The first one, is, com is completely determined that there's no, there's nothing random about it actually, right? It's always zero. But the second one is highly unpredictable. It's either plus one or minus one with equal probability. And so often in pure and applied probability, we need a way to measure how spread out a distribution is. So the second distribution is more spread out, right? The first one is just concentrated on one point. The second one is spread out across two points. And that's where the variance comes in. So variance uh, is a way to measure how spread out a random variable is. So this, I mean, this, okay, this is in quotes because this is not formally defined. We'll see more precisely what it means in a moment. A random variable is. So let me now define what variance is. So any questions about these examples before I do that? Okay, so here's a definition. Uh, if X is a random variable, and the expectation of x is some number mu then the variance of x is defined as v of x so it's the expectation but not of x it's the expectation of x minus its expected value squared So this is the definition of variance. Now, what is this? What is this? If you had to describe in words what this is, what would you? How would you describe this formula? What is the variance compute measuring? Uh, the expected squared distance from the um from the normal one so like how far out it is but squared yeah it's the expected squared distance from the mean from mu which is just the expectation right so if the random variable is always equal to its expectation, this is going to be zero. And that's seen in this example up here. So, 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 so let's do in both of these examples. What's the variance of X? Well, it's the expectation 
of x minus its mean squared, which is the expectation of x squared. But x is just always 0, right? So this is 0. So this has very low variance. The average squared distance of x from its mean is 0. Any questions about that computation? Let me move this out here. On the other hand, what's the variance of y? Let's calculate the variance of y. Well, it's again the expectation of x of y, sorry, minus its mean. The mean is still zero squared. That's the expectation of y squared. Now y squared, remember y is taking these two values, right? Minus one and plus one. And so if you square them, you just get one, right? So with probability half, this is minus one squared. With probability half, it's one squared, but that's just one. And that makes sense, right? The average distance of y from its meet, from its expected value is one. In fact, it's never equal to its expected value. It's never equal to zero. It's actually never equal to the average, right? So the second random variable is more spread out and that's articulated by the fact that it has a larger variance. So any questions about this example? Let's do one more example. Example three is, let's say I, uh, the experiment is, I flip a biased coin, uh, which has probability of being heads equal to some Q, which is a parameter, it's a number in zero one, probability of being tails equal to one minus Q. So the picture of this, the distribution of this is something like, uh, well, okay, and let's define a random variable. Let's let X be plus one. Um, okay, you know, uh, uh, okay, fine, let's just do this. Plus one of heads, minus one if tails. So, so the probability is, so, 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 I mean, the distribution of X looks uh, like this, right? So it's either plus one or minus one, but now you don't have equal probability on both of those outcomes. You have some probability Q on this one, and then you have some probability, which could be bigger or smaller, one minus Q on the other one. So that's the distribution. Let's calculate its variance. So to calculate variance, first you need to calculate the expected value, right? That goes in the definition of variance. So let's calculate the expected value. Well, well, well we, we kind of, um, or actually, you know what? Uh, let, let me do it with zero one. I don't want to do it with minus one one. Let's let's do it zero one. So then uh, this picture looks like. So then X is just the indicator of heads, right? Okay. So let's calculate, we already did this, the expected, we already did this in the last lecture. So from the previous lecture, the expected value of X, this is just the probability that uh, X equals one, which is just the probability of getting heads, which is just Q.
So, so this now is my mu. Let's call this mu sub x. And so now what's the variance? Well, it's the average square distance from the average. So it's the expectation of x minus mu of x squared. So let's let's calculate this. Well, so mu of x is q, right? Mu of x is some number that lies. Well, if, if this picture is consistent, mu of x is gonna lie closer to zero. So maybe mu of x lies here. So how do you calculate the expected value of this random variable? Well, there are only two outcomes, right? Either x is zero or x is one. So if x is zero, that happens with probability one minus q. And the value of this uh, quantity is zero minus q squared. On the other hand, if x is one, that happens if x is heads, which is probability q, then x is one and it's, one, the distance to Q is one minus Q. So you get one minus Q squared. Any questions about that step? Okay, so now it's just algebra. So this is one minus Q times Q squared plus Q times one minus Q squared. Which is when you do the algebra, which I don't want to do right now, is just Q times one minus Q. Actually, you know, the algebra is not that bad. Let's just do it. So we, we pull the Q times one minus Q out. There's a common factor of Q times one minus Q in both these terms, right? So we just pull it out. And then you get one minus, uh, sorry, you get Q plus one minus Q. But Q plus one minus Q is one. So this is just Q times one minus Q. So the variance is Q times one minus Q. Now what's the interpretation of this? So remember our idea was the variance is supposed to measure how spread out or maybe how unpredictable in some way a random variable is. This is telling us that the variance is some function of the bias Q that looks like this. So for which Q is the variance largest? When Q is one half. Yeah. The answer is Q equals a half. That makes sense. If you have a coin that's equally likely to be heads and tails, that's the most spread out intuitively. Another question is which Q minimizes? Wouldn't it be when uh, Q is either one or zero because you're yeah. guaranteed to get something? Yeah, Q equals zero or one. And so in this case, the variance is just zero. So you're guaranteed to get either heads or tails. Whereas in this case, the variance is a quarter. Okay. So that's the most basic example of a variance calculation. Any questions about this? It's a little bit confusing because you're taking the expectation of a random variable, which is itself defined in terms of the expectation of X. But that's okay. It's just it's just algebra with random variables. Um, so the expectation of um, X minus Y of X squared. No, oh, no, no, it's not Y of X, or it's mu of X. Oh, mu of X. Uh, uh, so, so the expectation of x minus mu of x squared. So, like the how, how do we get the next step? It's just like the like 
the rest of like expectation problems. Yeah, this is the so, definition of expe expectation, right? So it's, this it's is not binomial. Like this is no, no, no. This is the probability that x equals one, x equals zero. This is the probability that x equals one. And when, I mean, or, or okay, you know, we'll, we'll do it even more simply. There are, there are only two points in the sample space, right? Wait, what? Uh, okay, that was unfortunate. I hope I didn't just lose the whole lecture. No, it's still there. It's still there. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, what's going on here? Well, you know, what are these numbers? These are just the probabilities of the different sample. Remember, the sample space is heads or tails, right? So, this is the probability of tails, and this is the probability of heads. And when it's tails, then this random variable is zero minus q squared. When it's heads, it's one minus q squared. Right, so this is the tails point, this is the heads point. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. So I'm not doing anything fancy here. Okay, so I wanna make a, uh, okay, good. So now, Mm, let's see. Yeah, I want to make one remark about how we often actually compute variance of a random variable in practice. So this is a shortcut for computing variance. Well, what's the variance? So suppose the expectation of X is mu. Well, variance of X is expectation of X minus mu squared. So above, I just use the definition of expectation to start expanding this, right? But I could have done something different. I could instead have used the algebra of random variables. So this is the expectation of x squared minus two mu x plus mu squared. The first thing to note about this is that this mu squared, what kind of random variable is mu squared? Is there anything special about it? It's a constant. It's a constant. Sim so is this mu, right? So I can actually, this is a little bit, seems a little bit subtle the first time you do it. I can use linearity to pull all the constants out. So I get that this is expectation of X squared minus two mu expectation of X plus mu squared. Expectation of a constant is just a constant. But now wait a minute, what's expectation of X? That would just be mu. It's just mu. So if I simplify this further, this is expectation of X squared minus two mu squared plus mu squared, which is just expectation of X squared minus mu squared. So this is a shortcut formula for computing the variance. You don't have, you can, if you expand the square before taking the expectation and do this cancellation, you get this other expression. Any questions about that? Okay, I wanna make one more remark because this bugged me 
for years when I learned about this. And the remark is, why is why why is there a square, right? Like, why did we use a square here? I, th this really bugged me that like it seems completely arbitrary that you take this distance and you square it. Well, the square is kind of the simplest thing that uh, that measures this average distance to the mean. So here are some simpler things you could try. The simplest thing, the, the, the naive thing to try is just say, measure the average difference between X and the mean. So without the square. So, 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 so if you just don't do the square, let's, let's try to do this, right? So let's say we write this as without the square. This sounds like a good idea. It's the average difference, right? So this is the average difference. Well, I don't know, by linearity, this is expectation of X minus mu, which is mu minus mu, which is zero. So this doesn't tell you anything. Now you, you 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 could try something else, which sometimes comes up. You could try the absolute value. And this this will not be zero, but this is a pain to compute because you don't have any nice algebraic properties. The square allows you to expand it and then you know, just use algebra without any checking of signs. If you use absolute value, you need to check signs, which, which is really annoying. So you, you could do that. Conceptually, it would work, but it really kind of sucks. So square is the simplest thing that actually measures the average uh, deviation. And actually, this is some concept that you're kind of used to all the time, the square of the variance is called the standard deviation. The square root of variance of X is the standard deviation of X. And this is the you know number that you know and love from midterm exams and all that stuff, right? So for example, the standard deviation in midterm one was, 20, what does that actually mean? It means if you look at the experiment where you look at X, uh, where, where, where you, you have the experiment, which is pick a random person in the class. And you let X be their score. Then really what this is saying is that the square root of the variance of the score is 20. That's what it means when you see on grade scope that the standard deviation is 20. It's measuring how concentrated the, distrib the distribution is. Okay, so now I wanna mention one very important property of variance, which is how it relates to independence. So here is a theorem, which has a funny name that nobody ever uses. I think it's called BNMA's uh, inequality or identity or something. And this is theorem seven in the book. And what this says is if X and Y are independent random variables, then the variance of X plus Y is the variance of X plus the variance of Y. This, 
the assumption here is that they're independent. It's not true in general. So let's see a proof of this. Well, the variance, so so let's variance is defined in terms of mean. So let's write down the expected value. So let mu sub x be the expected value of x and mu sub y be the expected value of y. And now it's just a it's just a computation actually. It's a, it's not very exciting, but let's just do it. The variance of x plus y, well, by the definition, is just the expected value of x plus y minus the expectation. So what's so what's the expectation? Well, it's mu of x plus mu of y by linearity of expectation. So this is just going to be mu of x minus mu of y squared. Okay. So now I could expand out this horrific thing with four terms, but I'm actually just going to apply my shortcut remark over here on how to compute variance. The variance of a random variable is the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation. So by the remark, this is expectation of x plus y squared minus. All right, this shouldn't be in the subscript. This is by the remark applied to this random variable. And now I just start expanding. So this is expectation of x squared plus um, expectation of y squared plus two expectation of xy minus mu x squared minus mu y squared minus two mu x mu y. And now there's only one thing. Now I use independence. This is the key step. I'm going to use independence to split this up. By independence, what's the expectation of x times y? Expectation of x times expectation of y. Yeah, so this is expectation of x squared plus expectation of y squared plus two. Expectation of x is mu x, expectation of y is mu y minus mu x squared minus mu y squared minus two mu x mu y. And now you see that these cancel. And so now if you group the terms, you get that this is variance of x plus variance of y again by the remark. So it's, it's just algebra. But you, you crucially, the key is you need independence. It's just not true without independence. Now, you, any questions about this proof? So the key is I related this term, I, that term is equal to that term because of independence. Okay, now here's a remark. We won't prove it, it's on the homework. This is also true for n random variables. So if x1 through xn are pairwise independent, what that means is for every i and j, xi and xj are independent. Then the same thing holds.
It's the same proof by induction. You just do induction. It's the same thing. But I don't want to spend time on that. So, sorry, somebody had a question? No, okay. What's going on in the chat? Okay, there's some great questions here, which is why isn't this thing in the remark just zero? Why isn't this just zero, right? So somebody asked this question. And the reason is this is, the first term is expectation of X squared. The second term is expectation of X, the whole squared. These are not the same thing. Right? One of them is the average of x squared. So you you average x squared. In the second one, you average x and then you square the outcome. Those are not the same thing. It's like a plus b squared is not the same as a squared plus b squared. That's why this is not zero. In fact, it's always non, it's actually always non-negative because it's an average of a square, which is a non-negative quantity, but it's definitely not always zero. Great question. Okay, so now let's see a cool application of this, which is actually extremely relevant and appears in many aspects of our lives. So the cool application is, suppose I'm given a coin, which is biased, but I don't know what the bias is. With unknown bias Q. How do you estimate Q? Any thoughts on how you do that? If I just gave you such a coin and I say, hey, figure out what the Q is. How do you figure that out? Like, what are some ideas for, for doing this? Ideally, if you've taken statistics, don't just tell me, but if you haven't taken statistics, uh, give me your intuitive thoughts. Like flip the coin for 10 times. To flip see the how coin 10 times, okay. How many heads you get. And, uh, and if you see a certain number of heads, then what's your estimate gonna be? Let's say you see five heads. What would you guess Q is then? Then it will be a fair coin. Then it will be a fair, then, then you would guess it would be a fair coin, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so the, your, good, good idea. So in general, you wanna flip it N times and see how many heads. So let X be the number of heads. But what if you got unlucky? What if, uh, you know, what if you just got all heads? You could get unlucky, right? What if it's a fair, even if it's a fair coin, you could just get all heads. So how can you possibly know the, the bias of the coin? Just flip it infinitely many times. Flip it infinitely many times. Okay, interesting. <laughs> Spend a weekend, it'll be fine. Uh, flip infinitely many times. Okay, this is not practical. This, th this actually will work. There's a theorem saying that this will eventually work, but this- You will can just flip it by a large enough number which can be calculated and it can give you a very high confidence that you yeah, get okay. the correct you. So that's what you do in statistics. You flip it many times and then you calculate this, this number and you get a very high confidence. But what does that actually mean? So let's now see what that means. So we're not gonna do the infinite thing. So I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let Q hat be the number of observed heads divided by N. 
this is itself a random variable, right? So in particular, it's not going to be equal to Q. It's a random quantity. It could be, you know, it, it could be many things. But the, the idea that we're all getting at is if you flip it more times, you should get more confidence. So what we're going to do now is we're going to um, uh, calculate the variance and show that indeed the variance gets smaller as n goes to infinity. And then that will give us, I don't think we'll have time to do it today. We'll do it next time. That'll give us a certain notion of confidence. So let's calculate the variance. How do we calculate the variance? Well, this looks a little bit intimidating, right? It's N coin flips. So flip N independent times. So how, if I asked you to com compute this variance, what would you do? First, compute expected value. Okay. And how would you compute expected value? Um, well, we can, so E of X over N is going to be E of X over um, N. Uh, and, and we know that that's going to be uh, like QN over N. Yeah, so the reason we know that is linearity of expectation, right? So let oh. x1 uh, be, you know, one if the first coin is heads. Zero otherwise, et cetera, up to xn. You know, the usual thing we've done so many times. These are just indicators of whether the coins are heads. Then uh, X, the total number of heads is the sum of these, right? And so the expectation of X is the sum of the expect is the sum of the expectations. And this is because of linearity. And we calculate, what's the expectation of one coin flip? Well, it depends on Q, right? The bias is Q. And we calculated it, it's actually just Q. And so the expectation of X is just Q times N. And so indeed, on average, the expectation of X over N is just Q, which is what it should be. That's nice. Okay, so, no, so now we wanna calculate the variance. We need to calculate the expectation of X over N minus Q squared. This is a little bit annoying. There's a lot of points in the sample space. There are two to the n points in the sample space. So, okay, you know, there's a reason I told you this theorem before. If you have a bunch of pairwise independent random variables, then the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. And so linearity comes in to save the day here. So now by, so, 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 so this is annoying. So the better way is to say, observe that these are pairwise independent. Right, if the IS coin flips and the JS coin flipped are independent, they're independent coin flips. That was the assumption. 
So here I use that they are independent. So by uh, uh, the theorem above, the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. And each of these is just a single coin flip. Now, what is the variance of X1 over N? Well, um, this is the expectation of x1 over n minus the expectation of x1 over n squared. And now this is the magic step. I can just pull the n out. n is just a number, right? But when I pull it out, I get a n squared. And now that's just a number. And now I just have variance of X1. And I calculated that earlier in the lecture, right? What's the variance if you flip a bias coin? It's uh, this number, Q times one minus Q. So this is just Q times one minus Q over N squared. So now if I add all these up, I get that the variance of X over N is N times this quantity. But N squared is way bigger than N, right? So this is Q times one minus Q divided by N. And that indeed goes to zero as n goes to infinity because the numerator is at most a quarter, right? So this is a, at most a quarter over n and this goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Now, okay, I didn't get to the punchline. I was gonna calculate how many times you need to flip it to get a good confidence. I won't be able to do that right now, but this is at least saying that if you flip the coin a bunch of times, the more times you flip it, the more concentrated this uh, average number of heads becomes, and it becomes concentrated close to the true value, which is Q, the thing you want to find out. So, 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 okay. So, so, let me just quickly do a little calculation. So, suppose. Uh, so, so, well, okay, I, I won't be able to do this now. We will do it next time. So, so next time we'll see how do you turn this into uh, high confidence. Uh, this implies that Q hat is close to Q with high probability. That's essentially Chebyshev's inequality. And then secondly, I mean, the real punchline is this is how election polls work. So, you know, when elections happen, you don't actually count all the votes, right? Already on the night of, I mean, you count them eventually, but on the night of the election, you already get some very good estimate of what fraction of the people voted for who. That's because of this phenomenon. So we'll talk about it next time, election, uh, I don't know, election, counting votes in elections. Okay, so yeah, so that's it for today. So we didn't get to Chebyshev's inequality, but we did this interesting example where we saw that 
uh, using independence, you can calculate variance of sums of independent random variables. So here's a remark. The remark is that sums of independent random variables appear a lot. And what we've learned today is tools for computing their variance, understanding how likely they are to be close to their average in, in a way. And we'll, we'll develop it more next time. Anyway, that's, that's it for today. Any last questions? Thank you. Yep, thank you.